DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys? Yeah! This, this is the Players Lounge. Broadcasting live from Dallas Cowboys World Headquarters at the Star. Now your hosts, Barry Church, Danny McRae, and Nui Scruggs. All right, it is Friday right here on the Players' Lounge. Hope everybody's doing well. I'm Dewey Scruggs, longtime Cowboys reporter, joined by former Dallas Cowboys safety Barry Church. Players' Lounge brought to you by Hotels.com. I am in my SWBC mortgage uh, virtual home studio. Uh, Barry's not in his home studio. Barry's <laughs> living the life that he should hey. be living, thanks to Sean Khan. <laughs> Of the Jacksonville Jaguars. <laughs> yes, sir. I love it, man. I love it. Oh, man. You know, I'm just, I'm just trying to live out here, man. You know, just taking in all the scenes, man. And uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful Friday. It's a beautiful Friday. Um, look, it's the Players' Lounge. So, like I always said, where else would you rather be than talking Cowboys football with me and Nui? And uh, our, our, our co-host, D-Mac, I've seen a lot of the Twitter, Twitter questions asking, where is he at? Is he coming back? He'll be back mid-May, so just hold on a little bit, and he'll be back for us. But... Like always, let's get started on this Players' Lounge. Yes, that, in the business, Barry, what we call it is on assignment. So, you know, we still there we go. <laughs> he's still a part of the team. He's on assignment right now. So he's going to be back in May, but just right now, I just got to let him be on assignment, handling some things, and he'll be back with us rolling along here. So the draft is less than a week away. And in some ways, uh, if you think about it, Church, Thursday is kind of easy. The Cowboys know exactly yeah. kind of what will be there for them at 10. Friday is re when the real work starts because you're talking about the second and third round picks of the draft. And the Cowboys have had an issue trying to hit on these second round picks. And so, to me, that's going to be really key for the Cowboys in this 2021 draft. What do you do in rounds two and rounds three? You know, you cannot come up with another Tristan Hill. Okay, you just you just can't. Nah. You, you you need to have players who come in here immediately and get it. To me, day these day two players need to become either walk in starters or major contributors to the football team. Without a doubt, um, you know those two, those rounds two through three. You know a lot of everybody's kind of you know looking at that first round pick. It's, you know it's the glitz and the glamour. It's the flashy pick. It's some teams you know future franchise maybe quarterback or future franchise pick at that number one spot, and that's where all the glitz and glamour goes. But the real hard work and the real adding consistent depth to your team that's when those rounds two through four i believe come in that's when you come in handy that's when you get your guys that they might not be day one starters but you're saying to them hey look future the future could be yours just grind at it and it can get to yours and this is where we need depth pieces because we know this team going into the season you know i hate to say it but you know we're an injury kind of injury prone team i mean over these past couple years we have a lot of starters miss huge chunks of time and it kind of you know dismantled what we had throughout the season so for me, these rounds two through four, they're extremely vital. They're great for adding depth pieces. And then you might be able to find that diamond in the rough. I mean, we saw what we were able to find in Dak Prescott in the fourth round, a future franchise quarterback in the face of the Dallas Cowboys organization. So he was able to be found in the fourth round. Cheeto, or not Cheeto, was yeah, I'm sorry. Trayvon Diggs last year was in a second round pick. And though he had, you know, an up and down season, I think everybody can say they love his fight and they love the dog in him. And he could be a future cornerstone piece to this defense. So to me, the round two through three or two through four they're just as important as the first round they're just not as flashy you, you look last year at, uh, at Diggs being taken in, in the second round he was a player that we had talked about we talked about the, the we talked I should say about the Cowboys taking in the first so they, they get a, an absolute gift to get him in the second round I thought he was the best corner that they had last year and if they can mm -hmm. get some help over there for that young man I think he has a good future but just looking here at the Cowboys you go back to 2019 that's when they took Tristan Hill in round uh, in, in round two they also took uh, Connor McGovern the guard in round three he finally got on the field last year for him taking to 2018 Connor Williams uh, was your second round pick Michael Gallup your third round pick we've seen Gallup have an excellent career with the Cowboys and uh, Connor yes. Williams has started a lot of games but I don't know if he's going to get a second contract when you start to think about um, what they do with his position I think he's been a he's been a decent pick 
he hasn't been a Pro Bowl pick. And then I go back to 2017, yes. and you look at Cheeto Awuzie, who was taken in the second round of the draft. Cheeto is now a member of the Cincinnati Bengals. They didn't give him a new deal. And you did see Jordan Lewis, their third-round pick, Jordan Lewis, just signed a new contract with the Cowboys. So they've got to improve in this area. So we're basically talking about here uh, one, two, three, and then last year four drafts. Um, Neville Gallimore was taken in the third round, the the defensive line from Oklahoma. I think he is a player who can help the Cowboys. I see him as a rotational player on the defensive line, but they've got to start hitting here and hitting at a better clip. So while Thursday is going to be exciting, it's going to be the first round, because that's, uh, by the way, in case some folks don't understand, the first round is Thursday. (laughs) All right, it's just the first round. On Friday, it's rounds two through three, and this is where the Cowboys, in my opinion, really need to hit on these picks. This is where I trust a guy like Will McClay, and hopefully they'll listen to Will McClay because, Barry, the way things work around with the Cowboys, it, it's, it's a lot, they, Jerry Jones takes a lot of differing opinions. You know, he consults he and talks to a lot of people. So is Dan Quinn going to make the pick if the player is a defensive player or is it the position coach? Um, is it going to be Mike McCarthy? Will it be Will McClay? Will it be whoever Jerry or Steven wants? I mean, that's going to be an interesting thing when it comes down to where do they go. And as you, in my opinion, we start looking at these rounds two and three, People got pet cats, man, and they, they may decide, well, I want this, I want that. And that's going to be real interesting. Had somebody ask me on Twitter today about Mike McCarthy and, and did they think that Mike McCarthy uh, would be making a, a, a defensive pick? Like, hey, which about J.C. Horns? Like, hey, because he knew his dad, because it came out on that video on DallasCowboys.com when they interviewed J.C. Horn, um, when McCarthy was coaching down in New Orleans, hey, do you think he'd go with J.C. Horn because he knew his dad? I'm like, man, uh, I don't think that. Mike McCarthy is the guy I would lean on. If from mm-hmm. listening to Jerry's press conference, he spoke that Dan Quinn was going to have a major say. So if J.C. Horn is on the board, and the Cowboys are making the choice. I would be talking to one Will McClay and the scouts. Okay, I want to talk to the yes. scouts because they've done a lot of the work on it. And then I would ask Dan Quinn what would he want to do. McCarthy be the last guy that I'd sit around here and, and ask about a defensive <laughs> player. I mean, lo and behold, let's remember, Mike McCarthy was the guy who was the offensive coordinator of San Francisco when they had the number one pick in the draft and said, let's take Alex Smith over Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> Which, you know, yeah. it wasn't that bad of a bad. I don't understand what Aaron yes, Rodgers was. came to, but it, it wasn't it. that Stop bad it. of a <laughs> Stop but it. Look, one guy's going overall, to the Hall of Fame. This is true. Going to the but, Hall of but, Fame. The other guy is not. <laughs> well, he didn't have that bad of a career. But look, look overall, I Ooh. think, and I've said this for a long time. I've said this for a long time. This draft is going to put immense pressure on Will because, you know, we got the deal done with Dak Prescott. And I think everybody's happy about how the deal worked out. We got a little bit of extra cap space um, for that first year. But the next couple years, I mean, he's going to eat a lot of that cap space. And what we're going to have to find defensively is we're going to have to find these guys, like we said, in the second, third, fourth round to add depth to this defense. And that's where Will McClay and Dan Quinn, I think they have to come together and get put their brain powers and all the brain trust together to pick a team or pick a player that can help on help on day one whether it be you know in a nickel role or in some type of you know backup role or in a special team they got to find a player defensively to help this defense go along so if, so when we're picking like you said I'm, I'm with you on that McCarthy thing I don't think you know we, we kind of we, we, we look at his what, what he thinks he, we should pick but I think I'm leaning towards Dan Quinn and Will McClay one because Dan this is his defense hopefully they make it his defense and the carpenter needs his tools like we've always said when he was with Seattle he had the Legion of Boom he had Cam he had Earl Thomas Cliff Averill all those boys over there and he built that Legion of Boom defense in what he thought would be a successful defense, and it ended up being that way. So if I'm him, if I'm Jerry, I'm going to Dan Quinn. What do you need? What tools do you need to make this defense from one of the historically bad defense to at least middle of the road? Like, I'm not even asking for a top 10 defense. I'm not even asking for a Legion of Boom style defense, but I need him to get tools on this defense to make it a middle of the road defense because with the power we have offensively, with all that star power, Dak, those receivers, the running game, hopefully a healthy offensive line, I think we will be able to put up points out there and we can have the ability to be a top five, maybe even top three offense out there. So our defense just has to be in the middle of the road. I'm leaning on Dan Quinn to make the right plays here with the assistance of Will McClay. And he has. Will McClay has hit on draft, on draft picks these past couple years. But this, this contract that we gave Dak Prescott is putting a lot of pressure on Will, and I'm sure he'll be able to come through for us. 
Look, I, I think there's always pressure on anybody in scouting in the National Football League because you're always trying to find ways to improve your football team. Yeah. My big question is, you know, when it comes down to these picks, you know, who, do you, who are you going to listen to? We saw where Rod Marinelli had major juice. I mean, Rod Marinelli wanted Tristan Hill. Okay, he said, I yeah. want this guy. And Chris Richard is in the room, and so many people like Dave Hellman over at DallasCowboys.com and, and, and that, the guys on the draft show were like, hey, man, they need to go take Juan Thornhill to safety. And they didn't do it. Juan Thornhill ends up going to the Kansas City Chiefs as a part of a Super Bowl team, and he's been a starter there. And Tristan Hill is a guy coming off an of ACL who has not lived up to the billing. One of the issues that I had with the whole Tristan Hill thing was Rob Marinelli was saying, hey, look, I'm going to make a contract with this guy. Basically, a contract with this guy that this guy's going to go out here and play hard. Tristan Hill's last year at UCF, he was benched. The new coaching staff had issues with him, and he had issues with them. And so this is a guy who was not starting. The year before, under Scott Frost, he was starting. So the Cowboys basically didn't listen to the current coaching staff that was there. They went back to the to other coaching staff who told them what they wanted to hear. And what did Tristan Hill become? Tristan Hill, was not, he was a problem. And, yeah. and that's where you just say, man, I don't know. I'll give um, Rob Marinelli credit on this one. He's the one who wanted Leighton Van Esch. I thought they should take a linebacker out of Alabama, but they took Leighton Van Esch. He made the Pro Bowl. Rob Marinelli was also the guy who said, I want Taco Charlton. T.J. Watt was a better football player out of the Big Ten, and we've seen T.J. Watt has become an all-pro football player, but they were listening to Rob Marinelli. So that's my thing. It's just, Do you want to listen to your coaches or do you want to listen to the scouts? Listen to the people who do this do all the time. That, that's going to be an interesting question. Uh, let me ask you a question. Do you think it comes down to who has more juice in the room? Like Marinelli came in, he has this huge pedigree of being one of the best defensive minds in football. He's been in a part of the NFL for 20 some years. He's a part of the Cowboys. And do you think it was, look, this guy has all the experience. He, he should know who to pick. And in the situation we got now, do you think they would lean towards Dan Quinn in that situation? Like, this is the new guy coming in. He needs to get his defense in the right situation. He needs to get all the tools he can get to get the most out of this defense. Do you think they lean on him like they did Marinelli? Or do you think, hey, you know, McCarthy got the juice right now. He's the head coach. He's going to pick who he wants to pick. I'm hoping that they lean towards the defensive side with the with, with um. Dan Quinn when they go to pick like they did with Marinelli but I just want to know do you think it's who has more juice in the room because on the offensive side of the, on the, uh, the offensive side of the coordination or whatever it is uh, I think it was Marinelli and who was our OC was it was it it was Lenahan at the time I believe and I just think you know Marinelli had a little bit more juice do you think that has anything to do with who they lean on as far as uh, picking I've always heard it's who talked to Jerry last. That, that's the thing I've heard through the years. Who got to Jerry last? <laughs> it, it was, it was, that was kind of be, be, be the way it went. But here's t from talking to many people through covering football for so many years here. This has just been my take. Coaches are going to look at what fits for me now because coaches know they, they're like a milk carton, man. There's an expiration date. You know, they're here to win now. If you're Mike McCarthy, if you're Dan Quinn, you need to win now. If you're Dan Quinn, if you can turn this Cowboys defense around real quick, you know what happens for you? Next year, you might be hey, back coach. in the hiring cycle. Right. You, this, so Dan Quinn is going to try to find somebody that he wants right now. If I'm Will McClay, I'm not looking here at the now. I'm looking here at the next two to three years, two, three, four years. So, so they look at things differently. I go back to when Wade Phillips was the head coach. And on the board, I was told, was an excellent linebacker, Navarro Bowman. Well, they Ended passed up being on good. him because mm -hmm, they passed on him because Wade's, Wade had brought in Keith Brooking, a player he hadn't known. And so he's like, Yeah, I got Brooking. So we have Brady James and Keith Brooking. And those are the linebackers here. And the Cowboys made a mistake. They should have taken Navarro Bowman, and Bowman would have been an excellent choice to replace Keith Brooking because Keith Brooking's career here was it, it was on the downslide. He wasn't what he was with the Atlanta Falcons. But that goes back to when you start to have your coaches pick players. People don't ever talk about how Bill Parcells wanted Bobby Carpenter. That's the guy he wanted. Bobby Carpenter was terrible. He was never a, he was never a good football player here. And that was the guy that Bill wanted. I remember another player. I got to go back here and check my notes here. I want to say it was Al Johnson that they allowed Bill Parcells to, to, to take because they took Terrence Newman one year. And so Bill didn't want Terrence Newman, the corner. And so they basically said, all right, 
you get to go ahead and pick the pick the second round pick. And so he took Al Johnson, the center out of Wisconsin. Well, Al ended up getting hurt his rookie year, and Andre Girard went from guard to center. And Andre had an excellent career as a center for the Dallas Cowboys. Andre also played guard and center at Colorado on their Big 12 championship team. So he was a guy that position flex and center was really his best position. So Al Johnson became a guy who really was they ended, I think they moved into Arizona, but he didn't do anything here. But this is what happens when you allow your coaches to pick players. They pick the guys that they want right here and now. Scouts usually tend to, to look towards the future and building a football team. I mean, let's let's look who who Dan Quinn brought in already this year. He brought in, you know, Demonte KZ and uh, Keanu Neal, who played for him in the past in Atlanta. And look, I mean, I think that Keanu Neal was a solid. I think it was a solid free agent get. Um, just if they leave him in that hybrid linebacker role, I think it's a solid free agent fit. But but let's not you know mistake it for you know Cam Chancellor or anything like that. And if we bring in KZ, who's coming off a torn Achilles, and trust me, I've been through it. When you go through Achilles, it's that year one. Year one is the toughest. To come back from so I it, it's tough to me who you lean on in these situations because those two those two free agent you know gets that we got right there I you know I don't know if they're the best situation for us we had Malik Cooker who's also coming off an Achilles as well but when we had other safety options out there but he decided to go with guys he knew like you had just mentioned so we'll see we'll see I mean the jury's still out to me on Dan Quinn but um hopefully he can come through and, and pick us up some great defensive assistance out now. there now, I raised my hand. I was beating the drum saying, bring in some players and some coaches that Dan Quinn knows, people that understand the system, guys who can help teach the system. So I, I don't have a problem with that. And then you look at the deals that these guys got. I mean, they're, they're not these multi-year contracts going to tie the Cowboys yeah, up for that's a couple true. years. So, so, so they yeah, because KZ's going to have to guys. make the team. Right, right. So, so I don't have an issue with that. Uh, and there is something to be said for getting the right type of players that he wants. I mean, so it, it, the Cowboy Scouts did their job. They went to Dan Quinn and said, what kind of guys do you want? You know, what am I looking for in a corner? What am I looking for at a D-tackle? What am I looking for at, at, at an outside linebacker? So hopefully they've got the blueprint from him on what he wants for the defense, and you try to marry it together. But you better believe there's going to be times when the coach says, I want this guy, and a scout says, I believe that this guy's better. So how do you do it? How do you settle the, how do you settle the ties? And recently we've seen Jerry Jones has gone to his coordinators and position coaches to make the call. On, on on these decisions and, and my just thing was I, I thought Rod Marinelli I thought Rod Marinelli liked try hard guys to a yes. detriment when I think about Rod Marinelli how did Rod Marinelli get famous it, it, or how did he get known to most people it was because of the work that they did in Tampa Bay well when Rod mm -hmm. Marinelli was here the Cowboys never used a first round pick on a defensive lineman that wasn't what they did when he was the coordinator because he basically shied him away from that but in Tampa he had Warren Sapp first round pick you had Booger McFarland first round pick you had Simeon Rice first round pick if you want to run a simple Derek scheme Derrick Brooks yeah the boys right so if you run a simple scheme it's a lot easier when you have first round picks and great players doing it you can only have so many try hard guys I go back to that game at the LA Coliseum when they played the Rams and the Rams just ran through them uh, you know just two guys ran for a hundred yards in that game and up the middle they were just too small and Rod yeah. Marinelli in my opinion is where the Cowboys somebody should have stepped in and said hey man look uh, we need to get us some bigger guys this is where I, I was happy to hear Mike McCarthy at his press conference a couple weeks back say, hey, look, you can't have enough guys uh, that are 6'6", that are 275. So he wants some beef up front. Mike Nolan wanted some beef up front, too. They just got the wrong beef. But you, you, so, so that's, the, that's, that great, that's the great challenge of managing a draft room and, and seeing how you make that all work. So everybody's got a, a way they want to do business. I wish we could talk to Dan Quinn, man. I really do to figure that's, out a little bit more about that, what do you want? <laughs> that's what we need. That's the question. That's the million dollar question right there. We need to know what, it, what is in Dan Quinn's mind. What is he thinking as far as the identity for this defense? Is it going to be more, you know, how they uh, Seattle style where it wasn't, you know, traveling corners. It wasn't a lot of lockdown, man. It was a lot of zone keeping your eyes on the quarterback. They had a great front four that can get after the quarterback. And I'm not sure we have that here in Dallas 
So I don't, I don't know what the identity is, but if we did, we can have a better solution on what angle this team is going for. Because, and that's what, well, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but that's why I love Sartan at that pick because he's multifaceted at the corner. He could be that man. He could be that, that zone guy. He can fit any scheme, but that's why I love him. But that's the million dollar question, Nui. What is the identity of this defense going to be? Because right now, I don't know if he has his tools to bring that simple style defense that made it so popular in Seattle down here. I don't know if he has the tools and his defense has the tools to, to withstand. I mean, I, I just don't know and I'm not sure about that, but we do know one thing's for sure. If we go out there with that same multiple scheme type of defense that Mike Nolan tried to put out there, we're going to get run out the stadium each and every game. So please don't go out there and have guys standing up this way, blitzing that way. Just make it to where these guys can get the most production out of their defense and hopefully Dan Quinn can bring that. All right, let's take a break here on the Players' Lounge brought to you by Hotels.com. When we come back, what name, if this name is called on draft day, what's the name of the player that will make you scream in frustration at number 10? I'll give you my name, Church. I want you to give me your name of the player that will make you scream if the Cowboys take him at the 10th overall pick in Thursday's draft. We'll do that next right here on DallasCowboys.com radio. Adjust your cleats, adjust your pads, even adjust your helmet. But seriously, don't adjust your underwear because once it's seen, it cannot be unseen. Tommy John's fabric keeps you cool and dry on the field or in the stands, and now they even have loungewear. Yeah, loungewear. Shop underwear at TommyJohn.com forward slash Cowboys for 15% off your first order. That's TommyJohn.com forward slash Cowboys. Hey there, Cowboys fans. With Tight Cleaners at home pickup and delivery, cleaning your clothes has never been more convenient. Simply sign up at your local store, set out your dirty clothes, and one of our Tight Cleaners professionals will come directly to your home for a totally contactless experience. Your clean garments will be returned promptly the next scheduled delivery day, so skip the errand and enjoy life, not laundry. Visit TideCleaners.com or your local store to sign up for Tide Cleaners at home pickup and delivery today. Grab some OtterBox gear and get ready for hanging with the boys. From rugged venture coolers to tough as nails elevation tumblers, we've got what you need to keep your game day drinks frosty and your football feast ice cold. And with cases, screen protectors, and power accessories, you can defend your phone and stay connected to every play. Gear up at OtterBox.com and amp up the fun of every Cowboys game. That's OtterBox.com. Is your family a Cowboys family? Have you taken holiday photos at the Star? Was your wedding theme blue and silver? Have you convinced your kids them is spelled with a D? If so, every game day feels like a vacation to you, so treat it like one. Whether you're traveling to the game or watching from your favorite vacation spot, book a place to stay on Hotels.com. Proud partner of the Dallas Cowboys. Back to the Players' Lounge. All right, Dallas Cowboys football and Dallas Cowboys cheerleader dance youth camps are back this spring and summer for athletes and dancers of all skill levels. Save $25 with early bird pricing now through May 10th. Register today at DallasCowboys.com slash academy. You're in the Players' Lounge right here on DallasCowboys.com radio. I'm New East Coast, long-time Cowboys reporter, joined by former Dallas Cowboys safety Barry Church. Our other running buddy, Danny McCray, is on assignment. All right, Thursday night. Cowboys are picking 10. If they call this one player, I will scream. Michael Parsons, linebacker, Penn State. I don't. Oh, like I don't. You don't no. like that 4 3 no. linebacker? You don't like that? He's running 4 3 9. He got the speed sideline, the sideline. You ain't liking that? No. No, I am not. <laughs> I am not. Not at, not, not at 10. Not at 10. Um, it, it, go ahead and if you possibly, okay, and I'm not for sure, but you possibly could go ahead and trade down and get that guy 15. And so if you could trade, if, if you can get somebody to come to 10 for a quarterback and give you a number one pick down the road, and then you want to take Parsons later on, fine. But if you sit there at 10 and take Michael Parsons, I'd be like, no. We have seen the 10th pick be in play when it comes to um, the draft. 
the Kansas City Chiefs went from 27 to 10 to take Patrick Mahomes, had to give up a number one. We saw a couple years ago where the Cardinals jumped up a few spots to go to 10 to take Josh Rosen. So I don't know. I personally don't feel like quarterbacks are going to go one, two, three, four. Like some people are saying, I do believe they'll go one, two, three. So I think that you could see a quarterback in play at 10. Obviously, it depends on what Denver does at nine and maybe what Carolina does at eight. But I think the Cowboys at 10 could could trade back. And if let's say Denver or Detroit or Carolina takes Patrick Sertan, if they take Sertan, then yeah. You know, there, there's a question you, you gotta you gotta ask yourself. But I just don't see Mike Parsons at ten. I think that's a player that you could get later on down the road in this draft. And if you could pick up a one and still get that player, I would I I, I could live with that. But just ten, 10 Church, I don't know about it, ten. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's a little it's a little high for Parsons. I mean, he is you know a playmaking linebacker out there. Um, you know, silent and sign line type guy. He can cover well, but. If we get that guy, then, you, you know, what are you going to do with Jalen? you got Keanu Neal, who's basically the same type of player, a uh, hybrid linebacker type deal. So I just don't know what you would do with Parsons there at 10. So I can agree with that. Um, for me, the player that, that I think would make me scream if we ended up picking him. And let me preface this by saying this. I don't think he would get to, the, to 10. I think he'll be gone before then because I think the Bengals will end up snagging him up because, you know, they need some protection for um, Joe Burrow out there because he, he, he got his butt kicked last year. So I don't think this player will slide that far. But if he does, if he does, and we end up picking this player up, I would scream personally. Uh, and the player I'm going to say is, Pen- if, I don't, if I don't butcher his name, I'm sorry. Panay Sewell. Did I say that right? Yes, Panay Sewell. Did I say that right? Okay, all right. So I would scream if we picked this player, and I'm going to tell you why. Because I'm one of the guys, one of the few guys that believe Tyron Smith is going to come back and he's going to go back into that old mode. I I think he's going to come back and be one of the top tackles in the game, even though he's dealt with a lot of injuries in the past. But he missed a lot of games last year with these injuries. He's got time to rest up. I think he's on a mission to come back and kind of reclaim his throne as being one of the top tackles in the game. And then you have Lyle Collins over there on the right side. Now, he was injured as well. He was injured as well. He had surgery in the offseason, but I believe he'll be able to come back and help this, this uh, offensive line get back to where they were. Now, if it's saying that, if saying that, you know, these two guys are going to be healthy, you know, what do you do with Slow at that point? You know, you, you just wasted a first round draft pick on a guy that's going to sit behind and maybe, you know, in the future he'll be that guy. But I'm talking about right now because I believe this whole organization, I believe Jerry wants to win right now. So for me, I think if we went that route, and had that guy, you know, a, a kind of a swing tackle back up for a while until Tyron and them got up out of there. I think that's wasting the pick. And I think it would scream. I think I would scream just knowing that we could have had somebody, especially if Sertan and all those corners are available at 10. I would scream knowing we had a blue chip, an, an opportunity to get a blue chip prospect at that corner position to help out this young secondary and help out this defense overall. And instead, we went with a tackle who will probably sit behind, you know, Tyron Smith and Leal Collins for the first year or two. So for me, I would, you know what, I'm, I'm going to say even any offensive pick in the first round would make me scream. And I'm a little biased because, you know, I'm a defensive guy and I, and I believe defenses win championships. So I'm a little biased in that regard. But overall, if we, if we go any offensive route in the first round, I think I'm going to go ahead and scream. And who knows? I might not even watch the rest of the draft. Hold on, play. We'll see. Hold on. I'm going to fight you. I'm going to fight you on this one. Okay? I'm going to fight you on this okay. one. Okay. First off, I've said it before on social media. I'll say it again. Panay Sewell is not going to get past five. Okay? Atlanta will take yeah, yeah, four. Yeah, we, we, this is hypothetical. Game. I don't believe he'll get past. I don't believe he'll so get past. So yeah. if, if, Panay, if Panay Sewell is at 10, that means that he had that Laramie Tunsil gas mask smoking weed and it, something bad happened if he's sitting here at 10 for the Cowboys. <laughs> but, Stay off the weed. <laughs> but, 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 but. And talking to a couple of scouting buddies of mine, I said, give me a comp for Panay Sewell. Could I compare him to Jonathan Ogden? And one of the people I trust said, that's pretty good. John Ogden was drafted by the Baltimore Ravens, top five picks, started at guard because they had Big Zeus Brown on the mm-hmm. left tackle. And then they ended up... Uh, they, they ended up moving Jonathan to left tackle. He had a Hall of Fame career, was a building block on one of their Super Bowl teams. Panay Sewell, if you talk to people, they believe he's that type of talent, that he's a really blue-chip player. 
and a better player coming out of the Pac-12 than Tyron Smith was. And Tyron Smith is an all-decade player who's building a Hall of Fame resume himself. That is the kind of player that you could be getting in Panay Sewell, which is why I say he will not be there at 10. <laughs> okay? But, yes. but, <laughs> so, so if you told me you ended up having Panay Sewell start at guard and a healthy Tyron Smith is at tackle, okay, I'll take that. Yeah, because then you might have Ezekiel Elliott with the ability to lead the league in rushing one more time. I mean, that's the kind of player he is. But I go back to what I said before. Ain't going to be there. Ain't going to be there. Yeah, he, he ain't going to be there. He ain't going to be there. Be, because Atlanta and Cincinnati could both use that player. So I, I don't see that player there at all. And then when you talked about Kyle Pitts, um, the way people have – pumped up his tape, the way people have talked about it, even the video conference. If you haven't looked on DallasCowboys.com, they've got a lot of the great interviews with the players like Pat Sertan and J.C. Horn, Trayvon Mori, and Kyle Pitts, guys that they've interviewed here. There's another player who's so good at what he does and is a true blue-chip prospect, what arguably, you know, when you talk about stacking your board, a t- one of the top five talents in the game, they're not going to get to 10. They're, they're just not. You don't, they're not. You don't think there's a chance? No. Kyle Pitts. Like, like, so, so, no. so who do you, because you, no. you can think, all right, so maybe Atlanta, maybe Atlanta might grab him, you know, maybe Carolina. Other than that, okay. I mean, like you got Miami there, but, you know, I, I don't know, man. I don't know. I can, all I right. can see a scenario in which he could slide down there. Okay, so let's say Atlanta. All right, let's say Atlanta says we're going to go Kyle Pitts and try and do the whole Tony Gonzalez, Matt Ryan deal. So mm-hmm. Pitts is at four, Sewell's at five. These guys never get to ten. They never That's get if it. Atlanta Let's goes. Say, yeah, so for me, Sewell okay, so definitely. I don't think he. I don't think he's gonna make it at all. There's, I mean, I don't. I think there's no way in hell he would drop down to ten. I was just doing it hypothetically. But Pitts, I think there's a, there's an opportunity. I think there's an opportunity that he would slide there, and I would scream if we ended up taking him. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll give you the drop point where I the cutoff point for Pitts, in my opinion, is six to Miami, and I, I go back to what we said on a previous show. Who's the head coach there? Brian Flores. Brian Brian Flores, Flores, former linebacker, former defensive coordinator and linebacker coach in New England. As the linebacker coach, what did he line up against during his tenure there? Tight ends. Tight ends. Gronk, Aaron Hernandez. This guy saw what difference-making tight ends can do. So if you're talking about helping Tua Tungavailoa, you can, and I know they've got Mike Jacecki there, but Mike Jacecki, he ain't Kyle Pitts. And you could conceivably put those two guys out there if you wanted to. But I see that as the floor where Miami snatches that guy up right there, and it helps Tua. And even if Tua is not their long term quarterback, it'll help the next quarterback. So to me, when you talk about four, five, six, I've got Pitts and Sewell being the, I got these guys going between four, five, and six. That's where I see them at. So I, I never see these guys getting to the Dallas Cowboys at 10. And when Jerry talks about uh, yeah. sugar plums, yeah, he's dreaming because they're, they're not, they're too talented not to be there. We, we say that, but okay, let me push back a little bit on the Miami situation. Okay. You, don't think they, you don't think they would say, all right, let me look at Devontae Smith, former teammate of Tua. They did great numbers together down in Alabama. This guy's coming in. They have an opportunity to boost their offense with another playmaking receiver out there to go, out, to go opposite of Parker. You, got, you already got Jaseki there at the tight end position. You don't think they want to boost their wide receiver core rather than take a uh, Kyle Pitts in that spot? And that kind of that can push them further down the line. If they don't take him there, that pushes them further down the line. Now we're talking seven picks, seven, eight, and nine. And then yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. He might he might have an opportunity to slide down there, Louie. I, I go back to something you and I spoke about earlier uh, on on the players' lounge, and we started talking about just our, our top four, you know, wide receivers that we like, you know, the top four guys in the game. And one of them that we mentioned was Devontae Devontae Adams of Green Bay, second round pick. Um, we mentioned DeAndre Hopkins, number one pick. We mentioned Julio Jones, number one pick. And then we mentioned Stephon Diggs, a second-round pick. You can go get a second-round guy who could have the ability to be a, a Pro Bowl, all-pro receiver. You know, Michael Thomas of the Saints, another one. From what people who scout this game are saying, is that Kyle Pitts is that guy in terms of his position, that you can't find another Kyle Pitts in round two. As you you're going to find a Travis Kelsey like in, in, in round three like a Kyle Pitts is, but they're saying he's so much better than Travis Kelsey. So I just think if I'm Miami, I would take Kyle Pitts 
and then I'll just try to find another wide receiver in another round. And maybe this receiver is dinged on height, weight, whatever. But I'll go ahead and take what seems to be the most polished prospect at this position to come into the National Football League in a minute. So that's what I would do. And Mike Jacecki, he's a nice player, but I'm sorry. Mike Jacecki's not on some Pro Bowl teams. He's not all pro. He's not Travis <laughs> Kelsey. You know, we, you know let's, let's not put him, you know, let's not, you know, he's a nice player for what they do, but dudes ain't drawing up game plans saying, stop Mike Jacecki. <laughs> you know, and Mike Jacecki could help them. You know, he could help, that. you know, he could be the Aaron Hernandez, but Kyle Pitts would be the Gronk. So, um, I just look at that as that this is a way you can help supplement your football team. Uh, what they did in Tampa Bay, you've got Cameron Bray, but they also had O.J. Howard. So they had two good tight ends there. So I, I would, I just don't think that it has to be, hey, we got Mike Jacecki, so we can't look at Kyle Pitts. I don't look at him that way. I think he's a good football player, but, but he's definitely – uh, not the kind of guy that I would say no to if I'm in a position like Miami and I want to add pieces to help the quarterback. I can see that because, you know, overall, I, I don't look at him as basically just a tight end. You know, I look at Kyle Pitts as an offensive weapon. Um, you know, yes. he yeah. lined up, he had, you know, he lined up as an inline tight end. He lines up as a big slot. He lines up on the outside. I've seen him go against J.C. Horn uh, when Alabama played South Carolina. And they, he was going, he was battling him at the outside receiver. So to me, I looked at Kyle Pitts as an offensive weapon. Um, and and if, if what everybody's out there saying is correct, he can be this generational guy. He has a longer wingspan and a bigger catch radius than Megatron himself then, you know, I, I can't really see and I wouldn't fault Miami for passing up on a guy like that because if he's that great and has that much generational talent and just he can he can change a, a franchise like that, then he wouldn't fall down. He wouldn't fall at all. And maybe even Atlanta scoops him up. But we shall see. We shall see. So so, so uh, bring me um, this. this you no, know, no sooner than you said it brought me back to this point. AFC championship game. When you were playing with Jacksonville, you went up with a, uh, against Gronk, and we talk about you know a guy mm. in the red zone and what Gronk was able to do. And then Gronk, Gronk six foot seven, Kyle Pitts is six foot six. So what is it like guarding someone that big that you know is a red zone weapon? Well, see Gronk, see Gronk was a different animal because he never, and I think he would be easier to guard at least until the okay. point of you know the point of attack when you have to jump up for the ball because he didn't have a lot of moves off the line. He didn't have that fast twitch muscle. He wasn't giving you a lot of shakes. He was basically just using his brute force. So as soon as he got off the line okay. of scrimmage, if you got your hands on him, you could pretty much ride him out the way. Now, when it got to the when the ball is in the air, that's when it became a whole totally different monster because this guy can out jump anybody and he just used his body. Body and strength in ways that I've never seen anybody before. So I think he'd be a little bit easier to guard out in the field than a, a Kyle Pitts because Kyle Pitts, from the tape I've seen, I mean, this guy has so much wiggle. You would, you would think he was a slot receiver. He got wiggle like Travis Kelsey, but he's faster, has a bigger catch radius. It, it, it's, it's kind of, a, it's like you said, he's an offensive weapon. So I think in the field of play, he'd be harder to guard than a Gronkowski. But when it comes down to that red zone, Gronkowski just used his body so much, and he would just go over top of anybody, safety, linebackers, corners. If you weren't double covering him, I mean, it was, it was, it was hard to, to, to keep him away from the football once you got into that red zone, similar to Calvin Johnson. And that's where I can see so, uh, Kyle Pitts a little bit because Calvin Johnson didn't have a lot of wiggle, but once he got to that boy in that, that, that point of attack, it was hard to top, uh, stop him from getting the ball. So I'm just being a lawyer. I just asked you a question. You just told me Kyle Pitts – has the ability to be a better weapon than Rob Gronkowski, a guy who's built together a Hall of Fame resume. And so it, based on that, that doesn't get to 10. <laughs> that does not slide to 10. <laughs> We're all just speaking hypotheticals here. We're all just speaking hypotheticals. It doesn't slide to 10 at all. Okay, so stay with Kyle Pitts. And something that he was asked, and I think it was Al Harris who asked him in the video chat. Um, you can check it out over at DallasCowboys.com where they interviewed J.C. Horn. They interviewed Kyle Pitts. And they said, who's the best corner you went up against? And Pitts said it was J.C. Horn, the corner from South Carolina. And right now, most draft experts and most people who, who cover the National Football League are thinking Patrick Sertan or J.C. Horn to the Cowboys. So when you hear Kyle Pitts say, Hey, J.C. Horn was the guy. Uh, what do you? What do you? What are you thinking? I'm thinking because they're, they're two different styles of corners. Um, I feel like J.C. J.C. Horn might have been a tougher matchup for 
for Kyle Pitts because he thrives in that man-to-man. Let me press you at the line of scrimmage. You're going to get this all day. And that's what he did when they went against each other. He pressed them. He battled at the line of scrimmage. You know, Kyle Pitts won some. J.C. Horn won some. But he battled him throughout the whole entire game. And then when you look at a guy like Sertan, if you're a team that just is strictly strictly man to man they just that's all they do they lock up single high everybody else is locked up across the board then you got to go that jc horn route but the reason i go sertan is i think he's a multifaceted corner he got many tools out there he might not be as great in man to man as jc horn is but he's still a good man to man corner so let's, let's just not say he's trash at man to man he might be you know jc horn's 1a he's 1b but when it comes to everything else, I'm talking about the run game. I'm talking about uh, zone coverage, getting your hands on the football. I think he gets, gets a little bit of step above over J.C. Horn. And that's why I, I take him over Horn in the long haul. Because Horn may be that great physical man-to-man, shut you down. Hey, coach, I'm coming in the film room. Who I got today? I'm locking him down. All right, I'll see you guys on the practice field. He's that tunnel vision, locked-in type corner. Whereas you look at Sertan, you could do so much more with him. You can leave him on a nub sad tight end because you know he has that run support in there. Because a lot of a lot of teams nowadays, they'll try to leave that corner on an island on the, on the nub sad where it's just a tight end, and they'll run straight at him because a lot of corners they want to make business decisions out here, and they're not looking to tackle you know uh, Josh Jacobs running down or Derrick Henry running down. Yeah. But I can see Sertan doing that, and that's why I kind of take him above J.C. Horn. He might not be as great of a man-to-man corner, but he does everything else at such a high clip, and I think he's the guy that we need to go ahead and take. All right, here's where I rely on your expertise of the National Football League. With what we know about Dan Quinn and what he ran in Atlanta and what he ran in Seattle, who is the better fit for the scheme, Patrick Sertan or J.C. Horn? Without a doubt, I'm saying Sertan. Because in a lot of Dan Quinn's defenses, unless he's going against a guy like Megatron or something where they got to have that best guy on him, they don't travel a lot. You didn't see Richard Sermon, you know, traveling with the best receiver. He stayed on his right side. Um, Brandon Browner stayed on his left side. And that's how they worked in the Dan Quinn system. And they ran a lot of cover three where the corner wasn't specifically locked on that outside wide receiver. He had to keep his eyes on the quarterback. He had to see, keep his eyes on other four mate or other routes coming into his zone. And I think that's what I would lean on as a guy that has such or so many tools out there. He can help you in the run. He can help you in the zone coverage. And he can help you in man-to-man as well. Well, whereas J.C. Horn, I think, is a lot better in man-to-man than he is at zone. And I just believe that, you know, with the pedigree uh, Sertan has, I think he would fit perfectly with a Dan Quinn system. And that's the route I'm going with it. I mean, it, we, we see we see what, what, what Richard Sherman was able to do in his Legion of Boom defense. I think Sertan has that same tool set, but a little bit even more athleticism. And I think he'd be that perfect pick at number 10 for the Cowboys. NFL writer I follow on Twitter is Doug Farrar, and he did an excellent study on what he liked to call the abuse of cornerbacks. And he was talking about teams that took corners that just did not fit their scheme. He says the worst thing you could do. And basically one of the things he talked about is, hey, if you got a guy who plays man-to-man, don't bring him into your defense if he's playing zone. You're not going to get the best version of the football player. Look at Mo Claiborne. Look at, look at Mo Claiborne. We brought Mo Claiborne in, LSU, man-to-man. He won the Thorpe Award, and what he did best was just lock up on guys. Hey, Mo, you got this guy. Hey, Mo, you got that guy. And we brought him into this Marinelli system where it was mostly zone. We had him trying to chuck receivers and try to get back and look and cover two and tackle running backs in the flat, and nothing against Mo, but that, that just wasn't his game. He was a lockdown man-to-man corner who did, wanted nothing to do with the run, nothing to do with zone. Let me lock in on this guy. And we brought him in there thinking, okay, we can mold him into what we want him to be. And it just didn't work out that way. I mean, sometimes you got to let a guy do what he does best. And he played man-to-man and we tried to mold him. And that's just one example of how you, I think you got to... You gotta, you gotta pick, you gotta fit, pick a player that matches your scheme, not necessarily a player that's just great at doing one specific thing. All right, so let me take this a little bit further here. So you're the Cowboys, and you get to ten. Let's say Patrick Sertan is off the board. Now you have the opportunity to take J.C. Horn. But based on what you said, if they're not just gonna let J.C. Horn go out there play man to man, would the Cowboys be better off? Looking at another player, some people believe that Greg Newsom is that number four cornerback, or maybe even they drop, you know, they say, hey, we'll trade down a little bit and maybe gamble on taking Caleb Farley. I mean, I'm trying to find a fit here because what I don't want to do is go bring in a guy like Horn. If you say, hey, man, go play that man, 
um, and you mess it up. I remember when Nandi Asuma left the Raiders to sign a big deal with Philadelphia, that thing was a disaster. He was an excellent mm -hmm. man to man guy. That, that 3 4 defense that Rob Ryan was running went up to that zone in Philadelphia. He didn't get it. He wasn't good. And people said the guy couldn't play anymore. And it was a total abuse of the Eagles and that guy's talent. So if Horn is more man to man, is Greg Newsom of Northwestern possibly a better player, a guy who could play zone, according to some of the people I've spoken to? I'm going to say it like this. If, if Sertan's not there, I think you got to trade back. I think you got to trade back. And I say that because to me, and like we, we've had this discussion on earlier Player Lounge uh, shows, we like me and you think the same as far as we got to build a defense from the front to the back. Now, if there was that blue chip defensive lineman, if there was that blue chip interior defensive lineman, I'm all in it. But I don't see any of those, especially in round one, I don't see any blue chip defensive line prospects that can come in and be day one contributors that can go out there and make a difference for our defense. But I do see one in the secondary, and that's Patrick Sertan. Not saying J.C. Horn is a good player, but I don't see him as that blue chip prospect like Sertan is. And then when you go to that, that, that second level of defense, which is the linebacker level, do we have any blue chip prospects? You know, maybe, maybe Parsons. You know, he's a fast guy, sideline to sideline, can make plays and stuff. But other than that, I don't really see a guy that sticks out that could be that blue chip. We need to get him at 10. Other than... Sertan and the secondary. So for me, I, I would trade back if that situation came of, came about where look, Sertan's not there. Um, depending on how sold they are on J.C. Horn, I don't I don't see a scenario where the, if those two guys aren't there that we pick a you know a, a defensive lineman or we pick a Parsons. I think we trade back, get more picks, and get depth for this defense if those guys aren't there, if those blue chip prospects aren't there. All right, we got to take a break in here. Could Jalen Smith wear number nine next year? <laughs> <laughs> guys can now guys can now choose numbers. Okay, you can choose a different number. Um, Dalvin Cook of the Minnesota Vikings looked into it, and I'll tell you why he declined. And should the Cowboys pick up the fifth year option on Leighton Van Esch? Much more of the players' lines with Barry Church and Louis Scruggs coming up right here on DallasCowboys.com radio. Hey there, Cowboys fans! With tight cleaners at home pickup and delivery, cleaning your clothes has never been more convenient. Simply sign up at your local store, set out your dirty clothes, and one of our Tide Cleaners professionals will come directly to your home for a totally contactless experience. Your clean garments will be returned promptly the next scheduled delivery day, so skip the errand and enjoy life, not laundry. Visit TideCleaners.com or your local store to sign up for Tide Cleaners at home pickup and delivery today. Grab some OtterBox gear and get ready for hanging with the boys. From rugged venture coolers to tough as nails elevation tumblers, we've got what you need to keep your game day drinks frosty and your football feast ice cold. And with cases, screen protectors, and power accessories, you can defend your phone and stay connected to every play. Gear up at OtterBox.com and amp up the fun of every Cowboys game. That's OtterBox.com. How great would it be to travel to watch the Cowboys win on another team's turf? Pretty great. But honestly, just watching the game from anywhere but your house would be fun. Even a hotel bar with some guy named Phil from St. Louis who thinks Oakland still has a team. So whether you're traveling to the game or watching from your favorite vacation spot, book a place to stay on Hotels.com. Proud partner of the Dallas Cowboys. Adjust your cleats, adjust your pads, even adjust your helmet. But seriously, don't adjust your underwear because once it's seen, it cannot be unseen. Tommy John's fabric keeps you cool and dry on the field or in the stands, and now they even have loungewear. Yeah, loungewear. Shop underwear at TommyJohn.com forward slash Cowboys for 15% off your first order. That's TommyJohn.com forward slash Cowboys. Back to the Players Lounge. Hey, Cowboys fans, enter the free-to-play draft pick challenge presented by DraftKings for a chance to win two 2021 season tickets. Submit your picks before the draft starts on April 29th. Now, you got to be 21 years of age or older to play to see official rules and enter now. Go to DallasCowboys.com slash draft pick challenge. I'm Louis Scruggs. You are in the Players' Lounge. Brought to you by Hotels.com. Barry Church, former Dallas Cowboys safety, rolling along with me here. Our other running buddy is Danny McRae, another former Cowboys safety. He is on assignment. All right, so Church, Lake Van Der Esch, they've got until May 3rd to decide to pick up his fifth-year option. What do you do? This one's tough. 
This one's tough because overall this guy was, I mean, his first year he popped out on the scene and you were like, holy, but who is this guy? Like, who is this guy? But it's tough, man, because after that, I mean, these injuries and the injuries that he's had as a linebacker going in there and you got neck problems, it's, it's hard. It's going to be extremely hard to go in there and want to put your helmet and stick your head in there when you got those big linemen coming at you and running backs, you're pounding each and every play. Subconsciously, you, you want to go full head and go in there, but subconsciously, you're always going to be trying to protect yourself and protect that neck area. So for me, it, it, it's tough because then you look at it for the Cowboys perspective, you look well, you know, who, who we got? Who else do we got back there to, that can help? That can If we don't pick up this, where else do we turn? We don't have any depth back there. So for me, I think you, you got to pick up his option. I think you got to pick up his option, even though he's had those health issues and all that. You just got to hope that he can have a healthy season this year. And then maybe you address the need in the draft next year. But going forward, I think you got to get that fifth year option, even though it's a risk. I think you got to get it because you, you, there's nowhere left. There's nowhere left that you can go. The depth is just not there for the Dallas Cowboys. So I think they, they back themselves yeah. in the corner and they got to go ahead and pick up that fifth year option. I'm with you 100%. Uh, what you do is, in, is insurance. I mean, you know, if you don't have it here, what's yeah. the insurance? You don't have anything. You don't have any backup. So you go ahead and you pick up the fifth year option. So um, two players who uh, resigned this week. As restricted free agent Antoine Woods, $2 million, uh, defensive lineman, and Cedric Wilson, wide receiver, who had 17 catches for 189 yards and two touchdowns last year. He's back, too, on a one-year deal. How are you feeling about that? Um, the Antoine Woods, or the, the, yeah, the, yeah, the Antoine Woods one, I Antoine like Woods. that as a pick. You know, he, he came in, and I believe he had solid um, contributions to this defense. He's, he's not going to be the guy that's going to get you high sack numbers or put cons consistently pressure uh, on the quarterback or go out there. And He's not going to be that main focal point, that offensive lineman. they got to make sure they take care of Antoine Woods. But I believe he's a solid, solid piece to this defense and a, a solid rotational piece. He can come in and give guys breathers. And he's, he has a skill set and, a, and a, an ability to be a factor against the run game, which we know we need all the help against the run game we need. So I think it was a solid re-sign for them to bring him back to add depth to that interior defensive line. I think we still do need some more because right now we got Neville Gallimore. You got Tristan Hill coming off an ACL. So who knows where he will be at, even though he did start the season off last year. Um, having a pretty good season before he tore his ACL. So we don't know where he'll be at. Neville Gallimore, I think, is a star waiting to happen. I think if he can build upon last year's season, I think he can be someone that offenses have to make sure they take care of. And you bring in an Antoine Woods in there that can help get that depth piece when those guys need rest. And uh, maybe we'll pick up some more in the draft. But I think overall the Woods uh, re-signing was solid. The Cedric Wilson as well. I think, you know, he, he contributed um, to this wide receiver core. I mean, we, we, we got a stud trio right there in Gallup, Cooper, and C.D. Lamb. Now, we bring in a Ced Wilson and a Noah Brown. Those guys come in. You know, you get breathers there and there. And we've seen those guys make big plays um, during the season in past years. So, I believe both of these signings are solid high or solid signings. Um, but I will have to lean towards Woods at being the, the better of the two signings. All right, uh, the NFL has approved number changes. So if you are a quarterback, you can wear 1 through 19. If you're a defensive back, you can wear 1 through 49. Offensive linemen can wear 50 through 79. Running backs, tight ends, wide receivers can wear 1 through 39, and they can also wear 80 through 89. And then linebackers, they can wear 1 through 59 and then 90 through 99. And defensive linemen can wear 50 to 79, and they can wear 90 to 99. Jalen Smith, number 9 next year. What do you think? Oh, they're going to let him get away with that? They gonna let him. He can. He's eligible. Hey, He's hey, eligible. No, there's, there's no way. You know, no way they're going to let Romo's number get passed out like that. There's just no way. Romo is the... <laughs> He's the prodigal son of the Dallas Cowboys. There's no way they'll let my boy Mr. Swiper Jalen Smith out there rock that number nine. Now, do I think it'll look sweet? Hell yeah. I think it would look sweet to have a linebacker in a in a single digit number. I wish this rule was changed when I was playing. I had a fullback number. I had number 42 at the safety. I was sick. I had that old fullback number. If I could go back and they had this rule change, I'd be single digits like I always was. High school, I was number eight. College, I was number eight. Now I'm at 42 when I was with the Cowboys. So I love the rule change. I love it. I, you know, I hope I hope these players take full advantage of it. Like, what, like you think that's sweet to have number one at the corner or number two at the safety position? 
or these single digit linebackers, I think that looks sweet. And look, I'm all for the rule change. Even though there's some players out there, some older players, I ain't gonna say no names, guys in Tampa Bay maybe, that uh, hate this rule change and they don't know how to bite guys here and there. But I think it's a great change and I think it'll look extremely sweet to see linebackers, secondary guys in single digit numbers, so wide receivers in single digit numbers. It'll bring me back to those high school and college days and I think it's a great rule change. Now, uh, Dalvin Cook of the Minnesota Vikings currently wears number 33. At Florida State, he was number four, and he looked into it, thought about making a change. Then he found out, and as our producer Chris Beam spoke about, you have to buy of the NFL inventory for your number. So the NFL's already got a certain oh, number I didn't know of that. Dalvin Cook jerseys. Oh, yes, they've already got a certain number of Dalvin <laughs> Cook jerseys that are, already been, that are already available. You have to buy those up. So Dalvin Cook was going to have to pay one Point five million dollars to change to number four, and you know what Dalvin Cook so, said? What did he say? No. <laughs> Hell no, you ain't, Hell no, no. You ain't paying one point five to switch numbers. Hell no, but that's wild. That so guys that don't have their jerseys out there in the stores all like that. Like let's just say a. Uh, uh, Donovan Wilson. He doesn't have his jersey all out there okay. in stores like that. They can change with no with no purchase or nothing like that. But guys that are, you know, pretty much stars in this league that, you know, people wear their jerseys in stadiums, they got to pay to to be able to switch their number? So so basically, you know, guys who are free agents, um, who, who or for maybe Antoine Woods, you know, you possibly can go ahead and buy up those jerseys. But then again, he's making $2 million. So does he want to have to take, you know, maybe possibly a couple hundred grand out of his own pocket to just go pay for a number? This is going to be something that you see with new guys coming into the league, in, in my opinion. Because if you're an established yeah. veteran and you're thinking about, you know, Travis Kelsey, you, you want to pay this kind of money just to switch a number? I, I don't I don't see no. that happening here. Patrick Mahomes isn't going to switch to his college number. Like, no, it's going to cost way too much money because this is where the NFL owners are geniuses. You want to switch, fine, but you got to pay us to do it. So if Dalvin Cook wants to give the NFL $1.5 million and then he starts a new number and they go make more money off that, dude, it's good for the NFL. This is very smart business by the league. Yeah, it is. And I think you're right. It'll just be new guys that are first com- or coming into the league that'll, that'll take advantage of this rule change. Because like you said, if Dalvin Cook's number is 1.5 to change his, imagine what a Mahomes or, or a Brady or you know somebody like that. It, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be out of this world to change their number. And I, you know, the NFL, like you said, the NFL is smart. It's the ultimate business. And uh, overall, though, I think you'll see the college guys coming in uh, with the ability to have this, these low numbers, because you know all the veterans, they already they're already establishing their numbers. They couldn't use those those uh, low single digit numbers when they first got in, and like you said, they're already establishing what they got. So these new guys coming in, they'll definitely I can see a couple receivers rocking, you know, number two, number three, uh, number five out there. I mean, I can see that happening, but I think it'll be a new wave, and those old guys, they're just not gonna want to pay. 1.5 million just to switch a number. It, I, to me, it's not worth it, but, well, you know, hey, we'll see. Well, that was Cook. That was what Cook would have had to pay. So I don't know what Jalen Smith would have to pay to go to number nine. Not sure exactly what Ezekiel Elliott would have to pay to go to number 15. He wore number 15 at Ohio State. So, But these are just, mm-hmm. if you're a popular player in the league and you're a player that's moving product, it may, be, it, it, it may behoove you to just stay where you are. So if you're C.D. Lamb, going to number two is possibly going to, it may be too costly for you. To, to switch from 88, it may not, you know, you may decide, I can put, in Dalvin Cook's case, $1.5 million of money to a better use, <laughs> switching yeah. the number, so that's going to be <laughs> yeah. interesting there. Hey, I want to end with a question from Carolina Panthers head coach Matt Rule. This is what he likes to ask um, potential prospects, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you this, what he asked them. If you were on a desert island, what's the one recording artist you would want to listen to. He, by the mm. way, he chose uh, Dave Matthews. Dave Matthews' band was who, who Matt Rule picked as the one artist he would listen to on a deserted island. So who you got? You know, I got to go with my boy Bob Marley, man. If, if you guys watch the show, you see I got his poster in the background when we're doing my, our shows. But, I mean, especially if you're on a deserted island, you got to have those happy vibes. You got to have those happy tunes to keep the to keep the emotions going, to keep you going in the right direction. You don't want to sit there and be, you know, on some heavy metal and just, man, I'm sitting on this island. How am I going to get off? 
if you get those happy vibes, Bob's always pushing into his music, and you'll find a way to get off that island. Even if you don't get off for a while, you can at least be happy while you're enjoying the island. So I gotta have Bob Marley on my, on my speaker box while I'm uh, stuck at sea or stuck on an island. About 10, well, not 10, maybe six, seven years ago, before he got into all his issues and troubles, I would have said R. Kelly, but I can't. <laughs> So, yeah, you can't do that now. <laughs> nah, nah. Um, give me Stevie Wonder, because Stevie Wonder is okay. one of those artists where everybody likes Stevie. And Stevie's got love songs, he's got good songs. You know, you play that old Master Blast, I mean, he's got, you know, great stuff, Superstition. Um, I just called to say I love you, Overjoyed. I mean, the, the, record, the records that Stevie has been making since the 60s, are, are just classic. So I would pick something that is a classic and there's a whole lot of different ones he could go with. So I would, I would, rock, uh, I would rock some Stevie Wonder if I had just one artist to play. Solid choice. Can't go wrong with Stevie Wonder out there. Stevie Wonder and Bob Marley. Yeah, you'll, you'll be all right. You'll make, through, you'll make it through the island. You'll be straight. <laughs> all right, let's wrap the show up with a simple question. Cowboys picking at number 10 next Thursday. Who do they select with with the number with the number 10 overall pick in the 2021 NFL draft? The Dallas Cowboys select Patrick Sertan. I believe it's the second. I'm not sure if it's junior or the second, but I'm just going to say Patrick second. Sertan. The second. He's going to come be a cornerstone part of this defense. He's going to turn around this young secondary him, Trayvon Diggs. And hopefully DeMonte KZ back there can get these boys lined up. But they got to go Sertan at number 10. I believe he's a blue chip prospect. And I think he can get the most out of this defense if you add him along with uh, Trayvon Diggs out there. I am with you 100%. Patrick Sertan is the pick I'd like to see the Dallas Cowboys make. I am worried about Carolina at 8. But I'm hoping Carolina takes Rashawn Slater, the offensive tackle out of Northwestern. And at 9, maybe the Broncos take the quarterback. So it, it would be an amazing thing if the number one, uh, I should say the highest rated defensive player ended up not going until 10 in the draft and the Cowboys were able to take him. I just think he fits so many needs of what they have and that he could be a building block. And I'm looking not just at next year, I'm looking here for about 10 years that the Cowboys could have mm -hmm. a number one corner in place here. And you put Sertan and Diggs together knowing the kind of guys that they got to go face this year. You, you've got uh, Kansas City on the schedule, so you've got Tyreek Hill. You've got Michael Thomas, the, the New Orleans Saints. You've got Keenan Allen of the Chargers. you got Thielen. you got Jefferson of the Vikings. You've got Chris Godwin. You've got Mike Evans of the Bucks on the schedule. You've got Julio Jones and Calvin Ridley on the schedule. You've got Kenny Galladay of the Giants on the schedule. you got Twice. Jalen Ragland, who else the e right, who else the Eagles decide to t take. you got Curtis Samuel, and you've got uh, Scary Terry McLaurin of the Washington football team on your the, the, the wide receivers that the Cowboys are going to face this year. It's a pretty wicked deal out there. You got the Hamlin kid and um, you got the kid from uh, Alabama, uh, Jerry Judy, for the Denver Broncos. I mean, there's no shortage mm -hmm. of dudes they're going to have to face. The Raiders with Henry Ruggs. I mean, the Cowboys are going to be taking on some serious wide receivers. And it's a passing league, so I think you got to go ahead and try and address it. And I think Patrick Sertan, the second, fits so many things for the Cowboys. Chris Beam, our producer, who you got to take in a 10, by the way? We didn't ask you. We always talk amongst ourselves here. But but who you got? Who, who do you want to see the Cowboys take their 10? Okay. Here we go. Okay, so we're all in agreement. We are all in agreement. We want to see number two from Alabama. And I don't, and that's, in, who's got number two? Is, is Niswander the punter? Is he number two? Because. Oh, uh, Niswander, Ms. Ms. Wander, you got to get that up, Miss Wander. You got to get that yeah, up. Yeah, I mean, you so. Get that two up. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so just looking right here, man, he could go ahead and rock that. Uh, he can rock. He can rock number two here. That would be pretty cool. That would be pretty cool. Hey, that's the Players Lounge. We appreciate you uh, checking us out here. We'll be back on Friday. We'll review that Cowboys first overall pick in the draft uh, that they make at number 10, 15, 20, wherever they make it. Maybe they make two picks in the first round. They have done that before. We appreciate you checking us out. For Barry Church, pr uh, producer Chris Beam, I'm Dewey Scruggs. Uh, say again, say again, Chris Bean. Oh, Greg Zerline, the kicker's number two. Yeah, go ahead and snatch that from him. Yeah, go ahead. Snatch hey, Greg that. the leg, you got to get that up, yeah. Greg the leg. You got to yeah, get yeah, up, you baby. Go, you go, yeah, you go, ahead and take, you go ahead and take that from, from the kicker all day long. Kick, yeah, you just pay him a little bit of money, send him to Cabo. That's it. Just, go just ahead break him off a little bit. Ten. 
Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Just, just pay him a little cash and, and move on down the road. All right, that's the Players Lounge brought to you by Hotels.com. We'll talk to you next time right here on DallasCowboys.com radio. This has been a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys? Yeah!